setup. My name is Dwayne Carey and I will be doing your training for today on today's Feature Friday. I am a end user trainer with LexisNexis. I have been with them for over 10 years now. I originally started as a tech support agent for one of our other programs called Time Matters. I did that for the first year and a half and then after that I have moved over to the training department and have been training ever since. I currently train customers in our Time Matters software, Air Jura software, our Billing Matters software, CounselLink, and PC Law. In today's class, we're going to look at the vendors in Juris. The benefits of knowing how to use the vendors in Juris is that you'll be prepared for 1099 forms at the end of the year. So when you add a vendor in your Juris, you will set it up correctly that you'll be able to track all the payments you make. So at the end of the year, you can generate an accurate 1099. You also learn how you can have just one vendor to track information in case that people accidentally create duplicate vendors. We'll show you how to combine those vendors together instead of having multiple vendors in your list. We'll also show you how to remove a vendor from the list if you are no longer using that vendor by deactivating them. We will also let you know how you can reactivate that vendor if it does become necessary. We'll show you how during the creation of a vendor how you can prevent entries from being added to that vendor like new payment vouchers or have checks cut or going back into an existing vendor and setting those options up as necessary. And we'll also how you, we'll show you how to store additional information directly on the vendor, um, bypassing the current fields that are on the vendor form by adding a note card that can track that information for you. So a couple things to get started. When you look at your vendor list in Juris, you're going to see these two vendors you see on my PowerPoint, the firm vendor and the master temporary vendor. Everybody who has Juris will get these vendors. These vendors are necessary for Juris and you cannot delete them. The firm vendor is used for any trust transactions that you do. So for example, when you do your pre-bills, and your client has trust money available and you apply that trust money towards their balance on their pre-bill. When you go ahead and finalize that pre-bill and post it, we're going to create a payment voucher in the back end of Juris payable to the firm vendor so that you can cut yourself a trust check to deposit into your operating account. So this firm vendor may not be deleted or inactivated because it is needed for these trust transactions. The master temporary vendor they're used for those on-the-fly payments that you need to just get a one-off check for a vendor you're probably never going to use again. So this would be for someone who does not have a vendor record in Juris, but you need to cut them a check. These are not separate entities. When you add a transaction to the master temporary vendor, they're all posted to this particular vendor, but we don't keep track of individual vendor history of those payments and the details of that. You can see the checks cut to the temporary vendor, but you're not going to see too much else when you do a vendor inquiry. Also keep in mind, you cannot generate a 1099 for a temporary vendor. If you accidentally cut a check to a vendor and put it in as the temporary vendor, and then find out at the end of the year that you actually need to cut a 1099 to that vendor, then you will have to create an actual new vendor and be able to put that information on the new vendor, which I will actually show you how you can do that in today's session. So the next thing we're going to look at then is just how do we add a vendor in Juris. Well, for that, I'm going to go ahead and jump over to a copy of Juris. To add a vendor, we're going to go to Juris, we're going to go to Tables, and under Tables, we will see our vendors. And if I double click, I can bring up a list of existing vendors in Juris. As you can see, I have the default firm and master temporary vendor, along with my other vendors that I use on a regular basis. To create a new vendor, click on the new record and it opens up the vendor screen. And your code, depending on how you're set up in Juris, may auto number for you. You may have to number that code yourself. And then you just need to enter in your vendor name. In this example, I'm just going to use the vendor of Visa. We've got four tabs we have to take care of. First off is the address tab. Here you just type in the address of the vendor. If you wanted to add a second line again, um, remember hit control enter to go down to a second line in these bigger boxes. And then you could add anything you needed to add into the second line. And then you can jump down and finish filling in the information as necessary. 
Of course, if they're out of country, you could put the country. If there's a contact you have at that vendor, you could add the contact's name. You can add the vendor's phone number or the contact's phone number, their fax number. And then that reference number is generally your account with the vendor. In this way, if you have a reference number, your account number here, on the checks that you cut to that vendor, we can have this reference number printed on the check. So your checks will include the account number when you actually pay vouchers to this vendor. So that is the address tab for your vendor. Next, you have the flags tab. And this is where we can control what we want to happen with this vendor. So on this hold of all payments that we see, if for whatever reason maybe we have a dispute with the vendor and until we get that dispute resolved, we don't want to pay them anything until everything is set. If I check this box, Juris will not cut a check to this vendor even if they have outstanding payables. So if I do a check run and pull in, tell Juris to pull in all my outstanding payables and I have this box checked for Visa, we will not create a check for any outstanding payables for Visa. Conversely, maybe you don't want to add any new payment vouchers into the system from Visa. By checking the no purchases box, we will not allow you to add a new payment voucher for this vendor. And of course, you can always go back in later on in, in one of your existing vendors and check those boxes as necessary. The separate check, this will allow you to, if need be, if your vendor requires that you have an individual check for payment for every individual voucher, by checking this box, it will generate a separate check for each voucher in the current check run for that vendor. So if I do a check run and Visa has four outstanding vouchers with that box checked, it will generate four separate checks. Generally, you don't want to do that unless the vendor actually requires you to do that. The always take discount, if this box is checked and you have a vendor that allows you to pay early to get an early payment discount, when you go to do a check run, what Juris will do is it will look at your current pay, pay date, look at your anticipated next payment date, and when you pull in vouchers, it will look to see if there's any vendors that you will lose your discount if you wait to the next check run. And in order for you to get your discount, it will actually pull that voucher, even though it might not be currently due, into the current check run so that you can get your early payment discount. So if you want to make sure you get an early payment discount, then check that box on the vendor screen. The payment group, this will allow you to group your vendors together so that you can pay them during a check run by just choosing a specific vendor group. For example, maybe you do payroll out of Juris, so you have all your employees entered in as vendors. You could then, when that employee is entered in, have a payment group called EMP for employee, so then when you do a check run, you can just pull in those vendors that are part of the EMP payment group, and it'll just cut checks for your employees. So you can use that payment group as well. That is optional. The next section has all to do with taxes. Does this firm or vendor get a 1099 at the end of the year? If they do, check the box. And then how do we want to report that 1099 information? Choose the appropriate response. If I've already paid this vendor previously this year, but I hadn't recorded that information in Juris, I'm just entering them as a vendor now, then I can put those amounts that I've already paid to this vendor here so that'll be tracked and added to any new payments I make in order to generate the correct amount on my 1099. And then finally, I just have to add their tax ID number, or maybe if they're an independent contractor, their social security number. So just tell Juris what type of number you're entering, and then type the number in. Do not include the hyphen. If there's anything that needs that number printed out, we will print the number appropriately with the hyphen as needed. On the Terms tab, this is one of these payment vouchers due after I add them in the system. If they're due in 30 days, you would select Due Days, and in the Due Days, type in 30. This is due in 30 days. If it's due on a specific day of the month, let's say it's due on the 21st of every month, we would then choose Proximo, and then in due dates, put the date it's due, in this case, 21 for the 21st of the month. So due days due in a certain number of days, 
proximo due on a certain date. You can then put in a terms description. If there's a discount where if you pay early you can get a discount, you can put in the discount days, your discount percentage, and if there's a discount cut off what that is. The last tab, the default tab are your general ledger accounts. If this is a vendor that you will be you know, cutting them checks or purchasing things on behalf of the client, you may want a default expense code. This is the code that would appear back when you're having your client reimburse you. Now something like this vendor of Visa, there may be multiple instances where I have to pay on behalf of my client and there might be different things. One might be a filing fee and I might put that on my Visa card. Um, I might um, have some exhibits made up at the local printing shop. In that case, there might not be a default expense code because there's different expenses that I may use on this vendor. So I may leave that blank on the visa vendor. But if I was opening up something like the county court clerk and I have a filing fee expense code and that's what I use it for, then I would populate this with that filing fee code by hitting the lookup and finding my expense codes for filing fees. So this is optional. Fill it in if it's always or the majority of the time you know the expense code you need to get your client reimbursement. You then can select your default AP account. Now, most firms will probably just have an AP for AP account. If you have multiple offices, then you may have multiple AP accounts so that for that vendor, when you cut a check for that specific vendor, you can choose which office that money is coming from. Next is the default general ledger account for this vendor. When possible, you do want to try to fill this in. With Visa, it might be a tad difficult because there's all sorts of different charges that might be involved on my Visa card, so I can't really tie it to one default general ledger distribution account. In that case, I would leave it blank, and then when I create my payment voucher, I would have to open up my default distribution account and apply it to all the different charges that I had on my bill. If this was, for example, my landlord, this is a vendor I have because I rent an office and every month I pay them rent, well then I know what my GL distribution account is, it's for rent. So I can hit the lookup, find my rent GL account, and then pull that in. So when I create my payment voucher, it knows to use that 5010 account every time. So when you know what GL distribution account you need, pull it in whenever possible. If you leave it blank, then every time you create a payment voucher, you will have to make sure you include the default GL distribution account. And then finally, your GL discount account. What account are you going to use if you get any discounts? Hit the lookup, pull in your discount account, and then you'll be all set. And then when you're finished, click on Save, and you have created a brand new vendor. Oops. Let's make sure. Invalid account number. Please enter out. Yeah, all right. Let me pull something in for this default GL since I had something already in there, so we can continue on. And then we'll save our new vendor and close out. And that will create our new vendor as necessary. Now, if for any reason we want to include multiple or more information on a vendor, we can do that using a note card. So if I just want to include more information about my Visa card, I can open up my vendor. And on my vendor record, I will have a note card icon. And I can click on this to add a note card to include more information about this vendor. I could click on New Card, for example, give this card a heading, and this could be like an alternate contact person. Click OK. And then add that information here. Again, to get to a new line on this, hit Control Enter to go down. And then I could enter her information in. So you can add additional information here that you may need about this vendor. Um, could just be about anything you want to track about the vendor. You can create multiple cards, just click new card again, and you can give it a new caption. 
and I'm just making something up at the moment, and then add more information into your note card. Anytime you want to get rid of a note card, you just click on each heading to get to that note card. Once you've got the note card in the foreground that you don't want, click Prop Card and you can delete the card. And then save when you're done. So use the note card feature to add additional information about the vendor. I'm going to just move up on my PowerPoint a little bit to catch up with us. Next, you can actually attach documents to your vendor note cards as well. So for example, let me jump back in. I'm going to close out of my visa for a moment, and I'm going to go to ABC Graphics. Maybe ABC Graphics has sent me a copy of the W-9 form, and I want to include a copy of that W-9 form on the actual vendor. Well, I can click on Note Card, add a new note card, and we'll call this W-9, click OK, and then when I have my note card here, go to Insert and Insert an Object. I can create a new object from scratch from any one of these existing uh, uh, types of documents here. Or if I've already got like a scanned copy of the W9, I can create a copy of that from the file, browse out to where I've got that scanned copy of the W9 for ABC Graphics. Here I have it. And then down here, I can either create a link to it or I can just have the actual file in the note card. And if I click on display as icon, it'll show me a PDF icon. By not checking that, it'll just show me like a miniaturized version of the W9 in there, which is really hard to read. So it's usually best to display it as an icon. Click OK. Give it a moment to load. And now there's the W9, the Adobe PDF, and there it is on the note card. And if I ever needed to access it, I can save and close that. If I decided, oh, I need to see that W9 form again, open up your note cards, double click on the W9 Adobe PDF. Normally it should pop it up. Unfortunately, my virtual machine has been having some issues pulling it up, but that will work for you. Um, if you get a new W9 each year, you've got the choice of clicking on a new card and adding a new copy of the W9. I can see like W9 for 2015, click OK, and insert the W9 for 2015. If you don't need the old one any longer, then you can click on the old note card and drop that note card from the vendor and just have the current one listed at all times. So you can add documents directly into note cards that you want to reference from the vendor. If you no longer need a vendor, then you can deactivate them. As you can see, each vendor will have a vendor active box, and when you create a new vendor, it will automatically be checked. If I don't need that vendor any longer, I can go into Juris. I will use um, High Design as the example, double click to open it up, uncheck vendor active. Now, this one can't be because they have an open voucher. Let me grab one that does not have an open voucher, which should be Visa. Uncheck Vendor Active, Save, and Close Out. And now Visa has disappeared from my list. Now, anything that I'm going to create in the past for Visa will still exist in the database. I just removed them from the list. If at any time I want to reactivate a inactive vendor because I need to see information about them, and maybe you don't remember what the code was, you can go to Inquiry Reports and Reports, go to your Master Lists. Under Master Lists, there will be a Vendor Master List. Run the ma Vendor Master List report and make sure under Options you tell it to include inactive vendors and then print your report. That way you'll be able to find Visa's number if you don't remember what it was. Let me jump back to the report. And then just find Visa in the list. It should be at the bottom of my report. Scroll down a little bit further. And there's Visa and that tells me the number 111112 was the vendor. 
to reactivate the vendor, create a new vendor, go to your vendors, click on new, and in the number, enter the old number for the vendor, tab out, and it pulls in the old vendor information for you. And you can check that information as necessary. So you can activate, deactivate, and then reactivate vendors as is necessary. Now what could possibly happen is you may have duplicate vendors. So as you're looking through your list, you may see you have the same vendor relisted in there. Maybe someone didn't realize a vendor was there because your list is probably much larger than mine. And they added the vendor in again, not realizing we already had that vendor at some point in the system. When that happens, you want to combine your duplicate vendors. And when you, how to do that is pick one of the vendors that be the one you're going to keep and then choose which vendors you want to get rid of and deactivate them. To get rid of the older vendors, you're going to review the vendor inquiry on that old vendor or the one you want to get rid of and find out how much was paid out to that vendor and billed. Make sure we don't have any outstanding vouchers for that vendor. If we do, finalize the payments for that voucher. We can't deactivate a voucher or vendor that has a, an active payment voucher out there. So make sure all payment vouchers have been paid for that vendor. So once you have that information, let me go to my list in Juris. We're going to notice I have the United States Post Office here, but at some point we entered them a second time as USPO, and we didn't realize we already had them in the list. So what I want to do is to see, well, what payments do I already have on the United States Post Office? This is the one I want to get rid of. So I go to my inquiry reports, and I run a vendor inquiry, and I run a vendor inquiry on the United States Post Office, the USPO one that I want to get rid of. And I look to see that I have paid them $800. All right, now I know how much I've paid them. I can close out of my vendor inquiry go back to my vendors, and once I'm in, I can go to my United States Post Office and on um, flags put in that I've already paid them $800 on the previous vendor, so I've got that information there. Once I have that, and you can do this, and uh, you can, as long as you've written that amount down, you can do this later on instead of doing it first. On the one I want to get rid of, I open up the United States Post Office, the old one. I go in the note cards. I create a new note card saying something like duplicate vendor. Click OK. This was a duplicate. This was a dupe of vendor. 000000, I believe, is my United States Post Office. So just make some kind of note in your note cards while you're deactivating this vendor in this case because it was a duplicate. Save that note card. You can be much more. Um, expressive of what's going on and what I'm doing. I just want to get a little bit in there to show how to do it. Once you've got that note card saved, make sure the vendor is inactive. Also go to the flags, and if they have it, uncheck the gets 1099. We don't want to duplicate a 1099 for a vendor that's inactive that shouldn't be getting it anymore. So uncheck gets 1099, make them inactive, and then save the record close out, I lose them from my list, I then go to the United States Post Office record, the one that I want to save everything to. Again, I make sure I added that amount that I had paid to the previous vendor in the supplemental amount, so it will be added to the existing payments that I've paid, so I get an accurate 1099. And then I add another note card saying that this particular one was combined. I'm just limited in what I can type in here, so make sure you get the title. 
and then again make a note what happened combined with USPO one 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 two and added payments to supplemental amount. So make sure you add some kind of note card to let you know that this was had one of those combined with it so we have that information as necessary. And then save. And now we've gotten rid of our duplicate vendor and now again we just have one vendor to track information going forward. Again, a couple slides to show you to make sure we get the right spots. A vendor group versus an AP group. So we saw in the vendors that there is a spot to have a vendor group, but we also saw that there was a tab that we had to pick an AP account. So what's the difference between a vendor group and an AP group? So they might look similar to some people. Well, the vendor group, as I said earlier, is used to designate vendors as a like group. Somehow they're related to each other. In my example before, I used employees. You could also maybe group them together by when those vendors get paid. Maybe I do a check run every week to my vendors. In some vendors, I pay week one of the month. Some vendors, I pay week two of the month. So what I may do in Jervis is I may go into each vendor and specify when I want to pay them. Since Joseph Castillo is my landlord, he should get paid in week one, so he may be part of payment group week one. And I save, and now he'll be in that WK1 payment group. And maybe Lantech gets paid in week two of the month, so I can assign them to payment group week two. And I could group my vendors together by when they get paid and just do my check run to pull in those vendors that way. Those are examples of using the payment group. The AP group is usually used for accrual accounting. So those firms can designate AP checks to be credited to a specific AP general ledger account for one of their extra, maybe they have multiple firms. Um, and one of the common uses would be you want to separate the checks that are paid to vendors based on one of your other firms or offices using that same vendor. So you may have that same vendor being used multiple times that you want to specify which office is actually cutting a check to that particular vendor. So that might be one of the reasons why you use that AP group. So those AP groups are found, we go back to Juris. Right here we have AP accounts. You notice I've got a default AP account, but I also have one set up for my New York office in my database and one for the Boston office. So it might be you have vendors set up in Juris that when you pay them, whoops, did not mean to minimize that they have a specific AP account that they are being paid to under the default general ledger terms. And they might have one of these selected so that when they do their check, they know which, um, which of the firms actually paid a check to that vendor. Though that can be changed when we create our payment voucher, we could choose a different AP group so we know which firm paid that vendor because it'll be tracked in our general ledger. So that is the difference between vendor groups and AP groups. So in closing, a few tips to remember. To review an inactive vendor, remember to add a new vendor using that same vendor code to temporarily reactivate the vendor. In that case, use the vendor, or you can run the reports, master list, vendor list. Remember to include inactive vendors so you can get that vendor numbers necessary to reactivate them. Use the supplemental amount field to add money to a vendor that might have been recorded on a temporary vendor record. So for example, I may go into my temporary vendor and I'll do an inquiry report and I'll do a vendor inquiry on my master temporary vendor. I'll say just show me my temp vendors, select them, and then run a report, take a look at the checks, and I may notice, hey, Structure Limited got a check for $700. Well, the IRS threshold is $600 for a 1099. I may owe them a 1099 form, but I can't generate that from a temporary vendor. So what I would do is I would create a new vendor, Structure Limited, 
and then under the supplemental amount, add that $700 there. And then I could generate a 1099 for Structure Limited. So review your temporary vendor on a regular basis and see if we're accidentally cutting checks that are a little over the IR threshold and we may need to generate a 1099 form for that vendor. Find out who we cut it to, create that vendor, and then add that amount into the supplemental field so we can generate them 1099 for that. When possible, set up a default general ledger distribution account on a vendor. That way you don't have to take that extra step in a payment voucher of setting up the GL distribution account because we'll already have it set up in Juris for you. Use your note cards to store additional information for vendors. So if any time there's a vendor missing some information or you want to include more contact information or anything at all, W-9 forms, use your note cards to store that information directly on a vendor. And then you'll want to periodically check your vendor list for duplicate vendors and clean them up as necessary by combining duplicate vendors. Also, inactivating vendors that you may no longer be using by unchecking the active vendor box. So that way, your vendor list is much easier to find vendors for when you're creating payment vouchers. We do have multiple training options available. Um, if you would like further information on Juris, um, if you go to LexisNexis.com slash university, we have live instructor-led virtual classes where you can learn more about Juris um, sitting in your own office using an internet connection. We also offer live classes in our training room in offices throughout the U.S. So you can get actual an instructor-led course in a classroom setting. And don't forget our valuable Juris consultants. If you would like to have somebody come on site and work with you in Juris or do customizations or help you with your workflow, we have Juris consultants who for a fee can come on site and help you get your Juris up and running that will best fit for your firm. With that, that is my presentation for today. If you have any questions about this presentation, you can always email us at lntraining at lexisnexus.com. Again, at the bottom here, lntraining at lexisnexus.com. And we'll be happy to answer any questions you may have had about today's session. With that, thank you so much for your time. And hopefully we'll see you again next month for another Juris Feature Friday.